Hello, everybody. Um, just give me a moment. I will share my screen here and we can get started. All right. So my talk, uh, it's titled No Server, No Problem. And it covers the topic of how to build a serverless app. So um, I just wanted to start with a little bit of background, um, really about cloud and cloud computing, which is kind of the focus of this talk because um, <coughs> serverless is, is part of what you would call cloud computing. So really, over the last decade or even more, um, computing, especially enterprise computing, um, you know, basically running any sort of application um, for a business has been defined by cloud. And what cloud really did, for those who don't know, is it really transformed um, the way that you would run applications to sort of act almost as a utility. So instead of paying to you know purchase a bunch of servers and you put them in like a data center or somewhere in your basement um, instead you are paying as you go for virtual machines and it's usually there's a bunch of services to that help you solve different problems and you have simple apis for those services so um cloud kind of revolutionized computing um in especially in you know in the business space and even as cloud has been revolutionizing computing um service serverless has been quietly revolutionizing cloud um we'll get into a bit more into what serverless is and you know where it really fits into the picture um but for now just know that you know with serverless um suddenly running applications in the cloud is a lot cheaper, a lot simpler, and a lot easier to manage. Um, I just want to mention really quickly that this is probably one of the more technical talks, even within the tech track. Uh, we're going to be getting into the weeds a little bit. It is focused at, you know, it's not necessarily meant to be focused on people who are already developers, but it is meant to be focused at people who have some knowledge of, you know, of like, what a server might be or some idea of you know of how like of how like modern like web applications work you know as long as you feel like you are a somewhat technical person this is a t this is a good talk for you um it is meant to be accessible i really really want to emphasize that you know if at any point i've lost you or i've gotten like or i've gotten too deep into the weeds on something and you're a little bit confused please just, you know, raise your hand in Zoom or just speak up and ask and um, I can just clarify whatever you want me to clarify. All right, so um, a little bit about me. Um, I have four years of experience um, working in cloud and serverless at Aspen, which is a cloud consulting company based here in Grand Junction. Um, you know, the, my career has mostly been focused on customer experience and contact centers. And I've worked with everyone from small to medium businesses to Fortune 500 companies um, and, and building and giving guidance to them on effectively using the cloud. Um, so really, I just want to talk about what actually do I mean when I say serverless? Um, really, what we're talking about here is it's a category of cloud service um where essentially rather than having to deal with um a server uh or some sort of virtual machine um it's fully managed and it automatically scales up and down and you don't pay for idle resources so those are really the three things that define serverless um and i really want to emphasize that last one not paying for idle resources is a huge amount of money you can save um, because if you think if you have any experience using cloud or any sort of um, like just web hosting technologies you'll know um, that regardless of how many people are using your site you're paying a flat fee every month um, you know for your servers if you have if you have some sort of auto scaling you know it may be more or less depending on how many different servers you have running at, at, 
any different time, but at the very least you're paying for, you know, your one server and that can add up a lot. And, you know, if you only have a small audience using your site, maybe you just, you're just about to like launch your MVP and for now it's just developers or, you know, or it's used by relatively few people, then it's actually, <laughs> it's actually a lot of unused resources to just leave servers running. Um, and even then, you know, you have a, you have your server running and it's pretty much impossible to use like all the CPU on it, um, at all times. And that's actually also a lot of wasted resources that you're still paying for. Um, in addition to being a category of cloud service, it's, um, serverless can also be kind of thought of as a approach or philosophy of software engineering. Um, which really is focusing on using tools that are already there, um, making um, really choosing to, where possible, make use of off-the-shelf solutions um, and putting them together to build the solution that you need, and really only um, and really only function uh, focusing on where your company is actually differentiating itself in the market. Um, sort of this idea of there's a lot of un, what, what is called undifferentiated heavy lifting that goes into developing any sort of web application um, that, you know, that actually, if you can figure out, you know, if there's how to use pre-built tools to help you with a lot of like these small details that otherwise be quite complicated, um, it can save you a lot of time and energy and therefore, you know, development resources. Um, so really a big focus of this talk is going to be around, um, AWS Lambda, which is a serverless service. Um, and it is also a specific type of serverless service. So I've kind of defined serverless more broadly, and now I'm narrowing in into what's known as a function as a service. Um, so function as a service, um, type of cloud service, and really what I want to emphasize about what this does to just sort of explain it super simply is it just runs your code. So basically you have a, you have a Lambda function um, and you sort of, and it has support for various different languages um, and it's given an input event and an output. And basically you're just running your code without having to deal with things like the operating system or you know, or like the, like the specifications of virtual machines, you don't have to deal with um, auto scaling if like multiple different people are trying to, you know, trying to make requests at once. So the, um, when you run your code in Lambda or any other function as a service, um, it is being run in an ephemeral and isolated code execution environment. So what that means is that you don't have a server that's like running continuously. Instead, you have this environment that is within milliseconds created. Um, then the code is downloaded to it, and then the um, environment is destroyed. Um, so, you know, with these services, you're billed by execution time. So you're actually only paying for the usage of the service down to the millisecond. Um, once again, not paying for those idle resources, only paying when your code is actually running, when customers are actually using your product. Um, all, all major or cloud providers have a function as a service offering. So AWS has one, um, Lambda, Azure, it's Azure Functions, um, and then Google Cloud Platform, um, that's Google Cloud Functions. And if you don't know, I just named off the big three uh, major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. AWS is the largest, followed by Azure, followed by GCP. Um, and Lambda is the original cloud offering um, that I believe was released in 2016. Um, and the other major cloud providers have kind of followed suit and started to um, you know, move in the same AWS uh, direction as AWS with these serverless offerings. So um, let's talk about some case studies, some places where this, where these technologies were used to great success. Um, so migrating to serverless, Coca-Cola actually 
reduce the infrastructure costs for their vending machine monitoring systems by over one half. So they had, um, they had this application that essentially was able to monitor all of their vending machines across the country, um, you know, and, and, you know, basically be able to keep track of the inventory in them. Um, and they actually were originally running it on, you know, on more traditional servers, virtual machines, and they migrated it to serverless. And uh, it was a couple months process. And the end result was 50% uh, was fifty of their previous costs. So um, another one is iRobot. You probably know them for the Roomba. Um, they built a platform, they built a serverless platform based on AWS Lambda and AWS IoT. Um, Basically, this is sort of their primary platform for um, running, you know, Roombas and other robots. And it's actually the, um, the management team responsible for monitoring it, making sure it stays up, is 10 people for a global company. Um, and I'll get a bit in, more into the way that, the way that, um, Lambda just makes it easier to actually um, keep your site up and, you know, prevent outages. Um, but first, I want to go a little bit deeper into how um, a function, functions as a service actually works. So really what happens is the Lambda service gets an event. Um, so basically something like an API call, you know, somebody is asking is asking to, it's an e-commerce site and somebody's asking to check out their order. It's sent, uh, it's an HTTP request, um, it's an API call to a backend API. Um, and within milliseconds, um, the Lambda service creates a, a ephemeral container. It's technically a Linux container, although you don't normally need to worry too much about what's going on with the operating system unless, um, um, unless there's sort of more advanced use cases that's relevant. Um, code is quickly downloaded into that execution environment. So the code that you have predefined uh, sort of mapped to this Lambda function is just sitting in cloud storage um, and it is downloaded to the execution environment. Um, the code is run. Then when you finish running, the execution environment is destroyed. Um, so Lambda is event-based. It um, like I was saying earlier, you get an event um, sent to the cloud service provider and it runs the code to process that event and then it has some sort of output. It can actually receive events from 25 plus different AWS services. So it's usually when you're using Lambda, there's some other service living in front of it that's actually responsible for sending it events. Um, most of the, the two big ones that I want to call out for web applications, after all, I did say that you know, I'm going to talk about how to build web applications with serverless, um, is our API gateway and app sync. So basically each of those um, act as a proxy for AWS Lambda um, to help turn Lambda into a uh, HTTP, HTTP API. So we either have GraphQL, which is sort of a newer technology, or REST APIs, which if you're, you know, which is a little bit older, um, still widely used. And essentially, essentially, um, it API Gateway or AppSync lives in front of the Lambda service and translates um, the <laughs> translates the request that user are making into an event a, um, that Lambda can then read and process. Um, there's also lots of different services that can send Lambda events to Lambda for orchestration and data processing. So. Uh, one, one example would be events, um, uh, an event gets fired off when a new object is uploaded to Amazon S3, which is AWS's data store service. So uh, I want you to imagine, um, say you have a website where um, it's some sort of social media app and you want users to be able to upload their avatars, right? Um, upload a photo of themselves. And, you know, that's not really going to be the right size necessarily to optimize bandwidth um, if they upload like a really huge photo, you don't necessarily want to set that as raw form to every single user. So you can imagine a scenario where you actually um, 
where that actually gets uploaded for storage in S3, and then you actually have a Lambda that it gets triggered off of the new object being created, and then it can process that image and make it smaller, make it a lower resolution, and then, you know, and then it's actually ready for use by your website. Um, and then that's just one category, that's just one type of event that would be related to data processing. Um, you can do actually a great deal with data processing just using AWS Lambda. Um, and then the third category would be automation. So this is more if you have a very complex cloud environment helping you manage that. Um, that's sort of more advanced um, if you're getting more and more invested in cloud in your organization and your organization's growing, but it is worth mentioning. Um, so I do want to talk about, I've already mentioned a lot of the pros of Lambda uh, and serverless and, and other functions of service, um, but I do want to talk about some of the cons and then reiterate some of the pros. So the really, the pros are, numerous. So you have large cost savings because, again, you're really not paying for those unused resources um, because the execution environment is destroyed and you're not paying for it um, once the code is finished being run each time it needs to be run. Um, you're not having to deal with operating systems. Technically, it's Linux under the hood, but um, you don't need to necessarily like <laughs> deal with like operating system components or package managers or anything like that. Um, the network, networking is often a lot less complex, um, especially when you're using managed services um, alongside Lambda, because you don't, um, because the managed services don't necessarily need to need to have networking. In, instead, you just use the APIs that are available. Um, less complex scaling. So, basically, if multiple people are trying to make requests or send events to your Lambda function at once, it'll just create multiple execution environments. Um, you don't need to do, worry about load balancing or distributing those requests, um, and you know, and all the other complexities that often come with scaling when you have a application that needs to serve many, many, many users. Um, it's just in general a lot easier to manage. Um, there is definitely you definitely still need to worry about monitor worry a little bit about monitoring your application and making sure it's staying up and working properly. But again, it's just removing a lot of the complexities that you would have to pay people to think about or think about yourself if you're a smaller organization. Um, there's a vastly reduced security footprint. If you think about um, this being an ephemeral environment that just gets destroyed um, you know, after it's done being used, how do you install a backdoor onto that? You know, How do you infect that using some sort of um, some sort of exploit or some sort of, um, you know, or some um, sort of like attack. Um, so it's not to say that it's like, it can't be, <laughs> that like a Lambda function can't be hacked or that there's like, you know, it's like perfectly secure. If anybody ever tells you that something's perfectly secure, they are basically talking out their butt. Um, but it is actually a much reduced security footprint and can actually make your applications more secure because they're just simply lots of lots of avenues of attack and compromise that just don't exist anymore. Um, and then finally, can like, once again, you can easily handle any scale with minimal extra work. Um, so mad and I mean, that's very similar to what I said about less complex scaling, but imagine like you have uh, imagine for whatever reason, like some celebrity or something tweets about your website. Um, and suddenly you have a massive influx of users. Um, you don't usually need to plan for that as much because Lambda is, and other functions of service is able to just scale up and deal with that sudden burst in traffic. And then you're, all, and then you're paying a little extra for all, those, all these new users for that short time that they're using on their site. But as the traffic dies down again, um, you, you're once again only paying for actually what people are, are using. Now, some of the cons, um, and there are a few. So one is vendor lock-in. Um, most of the time, um, when you're using serverless tools, uh, oftentimes you're using managed services that are specific to the cloud provider, and they all work a little bit differently. And the code you write can oftentimes, you know, 
interact with those interfaces and those APIs for those, that cloud provider in a way that if you want to migrate to a different cloud provider, it can actually be extremely difficult, um, if not impossible. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, there are definitely ways you can design an application around vendor lock-in. Um, so it has less, uh, less or no impact, but it's definitely a very easy trap to fall in. Um, and if it's something you're worried about, it's something you should consider um, if you're thinking about using any sort of serverless tools. Um, you get less control. So sort of the trade-off of having all this stuff managed for you is that, um, you know, if there's very specific sorts of use cases where you could, where you'd want some more control over the sort of hardware you're using or, you know, or how the operating system is set up, um, that's, you know, that is just like not the flexibility there. One example is that say you have a machine learning workload that um, requires like a GPU, a graphic processing unit, um, Lambda does not support running code on in on a GPU. Um, so th that means that um, if you want to get that extra efficiency, you're not going to be able to use Lambda. Uh, it's, the next thing is that using it because it just sort of, you just sort of start building your applications differently once you're using Lambda and once you're using serverless, um, it just sort of fundamentally shifts how you're building your apps. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's definitely like a new framework and a new set of tools to learn. Um, and that sort of segues into, there's a less developed free and open source ecosystem around serverless, partially because, you know, it is part of these cloud providers, which are commercial businesses. Um, so people who develop open source software are, you know, not as inclined to build on top of that. Um, and partially just because it's not been around for as long. Um, and most of the time, if a if some sort of application it was built to run on a traditional in a traditional server environment, you're probably going to run into issues running it in a Lambda function. Um, something like WordPress, for example, if you wanted to run WordPress in a Lambda function, you technically can. I've seen it done, but the fact that the execution environment gets destroyed every time somebody makes a request actually can cause some significant bugs that I wouldn't recommend that in production. That goes for a lot of the diff, a lot of the existing ecosystem of open source software that you could normally take advantage of. Um, the last one would be that experienced serverless developers are hard to find. So if you need people as your company grows to help build the application, there's just less people out there who know how to operate in this environment. And that's really just because it's relatively new. Um, so. At this point in the, uh, in the presentation, I just wanted to give a quick demo. Um, super short, but I'm basically just going to show you how you can get started, um, excuse me, on using AWS Lambda and, you know, just sort of give you a very basic jumping off point. So um, hopefully you all can still see my screen. Uh, um, and you go. So um, when you're using AWS, you will first, when you, after you first sign up, you'll get to a page like this. May look a little bit different for you um, because you have recent, different recently visited services and whatnot, but the top bar, you will have this search where you can search for the AWS service you want to use. And I'm just going to go ahead and search for Lambda. Um, <laughs> excuse my s slow internet. Um, let's go ahead and create a new Lambda function and call it test Lambda slope startup week. Uh, and we're just going to use Python as our runtime. Um, and we'll go ahead and create a new role. That's not something really you would need to worry. I'm not going to worry about now. But basically, um, roles just allow a Lambda function to access other AWS services and other parts of AWS uh, by defining their permissions. Um, it's a good thing to know about. So. Uh, uh, Let's create a new function. And 
well, here we are. Um, here's the Lambda function console. And there's actually a little built-in editor that um, you can use if you want to just experiment a little bit with, with Lambda. Um, and so basically, um, here would be my Lambda's func Lambda functions code. Uh, um, it's already sort of has some preset code in it. I can actually just run test right now. And it wants me to define a test event. Uh, um, I'll just use this hello world template, click save. Um, I got to give it a name, test event, save. And right now, um, what all this code will do is it will just output um, status code 200, which you know would mean OK if you're making an API request. Um, so yeah, so you can see the response right there. Now let's actually have it do something a little bit more interesting. Um, you know, this is not a programming. This is not a talk on programming, so I'm not going to do much. But let's just say, have it add two numbers. So the sum equals two plus two, um, and I'm just going to have that be my body. Um, so this is just going to output the sum. And I can run it. And as you can see, we got four. So that just to tell you that, you know, you could really put whatever code you want in here um, and then use that uh, <clears throat> to run your applications. So um, going back to the slideshow, um, just go into a little bit more detail on a couple topics, and then we'll get to a and a so uh, um, let's talk about what a typical three-tiered web app would look like uh, if you're building it using Lambda and other AWS services um, and essentially trying to build a serverless web app. So you're going to have um, in a three-tiered web app, you're going to have a database, a data layer. Um, this would be, you know, so where you're storing customer information. You're going to have a backend API. Um, and then you're going to have a front end. Um, oftentimes, this will oftentimes um, this will be like a static front end, something like we're using a framework like React, Vue, or Angular. Um, so, essentially, the way this would be built is um, you would use um, you would use a database of your choice, um, but a good choice would be serverless Aurora, which is actually a serverless SQL database. And again, when I say serverless, I mean that it scales up and down automatically. Um, you only pay for what you use. Um, but it is SQL, and it's actually um, it's has it's compatible with PostgreSQL and MySQL. Um, so um, that'd be a popular choice if you're familiar with SQL databases, or you have Amazon DynamoDB, which is a key value store type of database. Um, you know. I don't need to get too far into databases, but the point is, is that you have several options there. Um, and then you have your Lambda functions which actually interact with the base directly. Um, and this defines the code for your backend API. So the typical pattern um, when you're building using serverless is that you have a Lambda function per operation. So you'd have a Lambda function for say, read customer or delete customer or create customer or, you know, Again, like maybe an e-commerce application sort of example. Um, create product, that'd be one Lambda function. Read product, be another. Delete product, that'd be another. And this all lives um, behind the API gateway. And the API gateway's job is to essentially define the different endpoints um, that, your, that your front end client talks to um, in this API. So, um, you know, so usually that's like a certain URL. Um, so it's like your slash products, um, and it's a get request to go to, um, the read, uh, for slash for your products and the Lambda function for that, um, create same idea. And then, um, finally you would have your front end, which would be react view angular, um, you know, one of those, um, single page application frameworks, uh, you could have have the code for that stored in an S3 bucket, and then you can actually host it on Amazon CloudFront. Um, 
or I mean, you can host it a number of places, but a great option would be Amazon CloudFront, which is a content delivery network for static files. Um, and you know, and if you do that, that um, you're not, you don't have to host any sort of web server to serve up the, the front end files uh, um, because it's all completely static and it just, and the content delivery network distributes it to endpoints, uh, edge locations all over the world. So um, your front end loads extremely quickly, no matter where your users are geographically located. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, hey, Dax, this is super helpful. Um, I was wondering if you had, if we're using GraphQL to pull a lot of the API data, where where would that sit in this layer? And we're using Cloudflare's. In and you're using what? Amazon services. Cloudflare work. Okay. As our service yes. setup. Yeah. yeah. So um, if you're using Cloudflare workers, my recommendation actually would be if you want to use GraphQL would be um, to use something like um, you could actually do go the route of using a mono Lambda and then doing something like uh, Apollo actually supports uh, GraphQL in a mono Lambda um, or look into what Cloudflare actually offers um, in terms of GraphQL. So I'm not really super familiar with their ecosystem, but um, and okay. I say mono lambda, but like a mono function, right? So a function that's sort of responsible for all the different endpoints. Um, in an AWS environment, my recommendation would be to use AppSync, um, but you know it's obviously going to be a little bit different with Cloudflare workers. Um, but yeah, Apollo is a great option for that. Um, okay. And then you know it's a little bit different because you actually do define um, the code for each different uh, resolver on every. Um, all within like the same function, right? Rather than multiple, many distributed functions, but it works pretty well, um, at least from what I've used of it, which is not a lot, but that answer your question? Thanks. Yeah, I was trying to figure out where the layer in these, where's the front end in the diagram on the right, like where the mm -hmm. front end is, the static front end is sitting. Oh yeah. I'm using spells for that. And where the GraphQL layer, like, is that the Amazon API gateway in this example? If I if we were to use GraphQL, yeah. So in um, in AWS, I would use AppSync, but it essentially look it would essentially be in the same spot in the diagram. Okay, um, got it. That's what I was trying. To think okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I wanted to do a bit of a deep dive on pricing, um, just to talk about you know, like what this can actually look like in practice. Um, so as with most cloud services, pricing is a little complex. Um, you know, it's kind of just, you're gonna be your experience anytime you're using cloud is, um, <laughs> you have to go to the pricing page and sort of figure out like how much you're actually gonna be spending. It's usually not a flat up, <laughs> flat monthly fee, you know, in advance. Um, but the upside of that is that it's usually much cheaper than anything where there's a flat, flat monthly fee. Um, so it's based on two factors. So you have requests and then you have gigabyte seconds. Requests, um, basically you have a fat, fat fee that every single request you get, um, regardless of how long the function runs for. And then gigabyte seconds is uh, fractions of a second that the function ran for divided by the gigabytes of memory you have configured on the function. Um, so I could even, show you so you can actually in your function go and um modify the amount of memory um that it has available to it um so that's just the ram um you can do up to 1024 megabits uh mega megabytes sorry uh, of of memory um, and that's just something you want to adjust according to your workload and um, basically for it's <clears throat> and it's basically seconds over over gigabytes um, so let's look at an example of that uh, so you have three million requests per month um, and an average function duration of 120 milliseconds and then you have 1536 megabytes memory and you choose the 86 uh, times 86 processor 
option. And what you're going to end up with is um, the total charge for those 3 million requests you made is $2.33 after you take into account the, the AWS free tier. So 3 million, $2.33. That's, you know, that's not a lot you're spending. Um, if you think about uh, that as like in terms of say, they make like a, a customer makes like 20%, sorry, 20 different requests over the course of, you know, buying a product, like that's fractions of a cent that you're spending for every product you're selling. Um, <laughs> I like using the e-commerce example, um, but yeah. And then, you know, 40 cents of that flat free for every request. Um, my, actually, my experience, or at least my understanding is that Cloudflare workers can be even cheaper than that. Um, but, you know, I'm mostly focusing on Lambda in this talk. Um, but yeah, we brought up Cloudflare workers and they're actually a great, a great tool as well. And it's really low priced. Um, so let's talk about some common hangups. These are things that you're going to run into, issues you're going to have that you might not normally have while developing that you will probably run into at some point using serverless, especially as you get more and more invested in it. So uh, I basically have each issue you'll run into and then um, one of the main solutions to deal with it uh, just under. So the first one is cold starts. Because it's spinning up, the, uh, because the um, execution environment is being created very, very quickly in fractions of a second, it's just getting spun up um, as your request happens. Um, sometimes you can run into something that's called a cold start. And that's basically where um, the Lambda function hasn't been invoked for a while and it's in a cold state where it's not ready to receive new requests. And um, basically what happens is it just takes a little bit longer than normal to respond to the request. Now we're still talking about less than a second here, but for very time sensitive sorts of workloads, um, this can become a problem. Um, so the way you deal with that is you enable what's called provision concurrency. Um, which basically keeps your Lambda functions warm as it's referred to um, at all times up to a certain uh, amount of concurrent requests. Um, and then now the issue with provision concurrency is that you lose the, is that you're actually still paying a flat fee for as long as you have that enabled um, regardless of usage. Um, but if you really have super time sensitive workloads, that's how you can deal with this. And, you know, you <laughs> lose out on some of the, on some of the like benefits of Lambda in terms of cost savings, but you do still get all of the benefits in terms of ease of management. Um, another issue you will run into is timeouts. So a Lambda function, um, and it varies by cloud provider, but for Lambda functions, the maximum time that it can run for is 15 minutes. If your, um, if your code runs for any longer than that, it'll basically just die on you. Um, it'll throw an error, you'll get an error back um, from the Lambda and it will just say it timed out and it'll just stop execution at that 15 minutes. So if you have these long running workloads that you wanna run in Lambda, there's sort of two approaches that I take there. You, I, one, I'd split it up into multiple different Lambda functions. And two is that I would use step functions, which is an AWS service um, that helps. And step functions essentially help you um, orchestrate multiple different Lambdas into workflows. So um, basically, um, you can have like a step one, step two, step three, and those all run one after another. Um, and it's relatively easy to define those workloads. Um, and, you know, it really does help with this sort of use case where, you know, otherwise you have a very long running Lambda function. Um, you'll run into issues processing large files. Um, essentially because you have more, less, you have more limited memory resources most of the time, um, in a Lambda function. Um, so you can't really scale up to like gigabytes and gigabytes of, of Ram like you can with a virtual machine. Uh, if you have to process a large file, um, it's possible you just exhaust the memory of the Lambda function really easily. So the, really the main approach there is just split the file into chunks and process each chunk individually, or just make sure that you're only processing each one chunk at a time in memory and you're not trying to load the entire file into memory. Um, 
there are definitely challenges with local development. So if you're trying to basically run the your serverless environment, um, just r run whatever code you want to ultimately run on Lambda and run it locally, um, it's pretty. It can be pretty difficult because you know these are runtimes that run in the cloud and getting it all set up the way it would actually to actually like you know imitate your actual cloud environment can be pretty challenging. Um, there are frameworks to help with this though. Um, so you have the serverless framework is a big one. Um, AWS SAM is AWS's own native option. And then I'm actually pretty partial to what's called serverless stack. Um, what, that, what that does, what that tool does is it basically, um, basically still actually runs the code in Lambda, AWS Lambda, but it uses a, um, it basically uses a pretty interesting um, setup to basically instantly hot reload the code even as you're working on it. Um, and then sort of reroute the request from Lambda to your local environment. Um, you know, so what this means is that like all of your external resources, like your databases would still be in the cloud. Um, but like, as you're cha making changes to your code, you can um, use that, lo that local copy and it will update it extremely fast. So um, the last common hangup I want to talk about is highly stateful real-time applications. I like to use the example of game servers, and this is just not the best use case for Lambda. Um, so imagine you're trying to run a multiplayer game. Um, you have like, <laughs> Lambda has all of these, um, all of these like isolated environments. So you can't just store like the state of the game in memory. You have to store it in some sort of database, and then you have to deal with the read writes of the database and you know it's like it, it's just actually doesn't really work well for that sort of use case so um if, don't try and write a game server in lambda and if you could describe your application as highly stateful in real time um you may need to consider a different solution um some tips tricks and best practices um number one use environment variables for configuration so there's some sort of value that you know that your lambda function needs to know about, but it could potentially change. Say like the um, the a the like resource identifier for a different cloud resource, like a database, like um, you know like the database address. Um, you can use environment variables to actually pass that in. And once again, I can even show you that. So um, in the configuration, you can go and you can add environment variables, and it's just a key value pair. And then within your code, you can access that because um, you just use the built-in environment variable, um, very, just built the built-in libraries in your language for accessing environment variables. Um, so the next one is the console is great for playing around, um, but you should use an infrastructure as code tool for production. So infrastructure as code is essentially is um, lets you define templates that provision your cloud resources for you. And um, there's a number of popular ones. Terraform um, is really probably the biggest. CloudFormation is AWS's native offering. AWS CDK is a tool um, that lets you do infrastructure as code um, and <coughs> basically use languages like Python or, or JavaScript for it instead of using um, template languages. And then Palami is similar um, to AWS CDK, um, but it's not a tool created by AWS. And Terraform is something that's um, all cloud providers, cloud formation is AWS specific. AWS CDK is AWS specific, and then Palami is all, all cloud providers. Um, and then my next piece of advice is that if you're experimenting for the first time, you should set up a billing alarm, um, basically to make sure because you're paying as you go, you're paying as you use resources, just make sure that you're not spending more money on accident than you intended to spend. Um, there's lots of tutorials on how to set this up on YouTube. Um, so just look up like AWS billing alarm setup. Um, and so then um, we have about 15 minutes left and uh, I just wanted to spend some time doing a QA and use case round table. Um, so I actually have some question prompts up on the screen, things you can ask me about. Um, so 
you know, I'd just love to hear from everybody here. Hold on. How can I see chat? I got it. Um, my favorite project to work on so far. Oh, that's a good one. There's been a, a lot of projects. Um, you know, so I actually, uh, um, last year or so, I've been working on a, um, working with a team to build it. A large call center management application um, that we use here at Aspen, and, and it's been it's been really fun. Um, it's kind of like the it's kind of the biggest project I've ever done, um, and it's you know I don't know, know how much I can talk about about yet because it's not really released to the public. But um, you know, getting to, to sort of deal with like you know all the different hangups of like a large production application, um, web application. Um, and sort of thinking about things like permission management, um, you know, and like all those and like the sorts of things that like enterprise users might have might want. Um, it's it's been actually it's it's been a fun experience, especially like getting to lead a project like that um, for the first time. Really enjoyed that. Jack, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, if you need to move in the future, one of the drawbacks is the uh, and I'm notes really quick. One second, um, vendor lock-in, moving mm -hmm. to new vendors. So are there things we're still early on? Are there things that you can do with your architecture early on that you recommend so that you do set yourself up to be able to migrate easily and freely, or is it still yeah. painful regardless? Um, it, so there's definitely things that are going to be hard to avoid um, that are always going to be pain points, but there's definitely ways you can make it easier. So my really my big piece of advice there is to um, is that if you want to avoid vendor lock in, um, then you should avoid um, leading too heavily on um, cloud services that have proprietary APIs. So, for example, use like you can still go serverless but use like aurora serverless over dynamo db because then you are writing all your database calls in sql instead of um instead of you know calling the dynamo db apis now um there are definitely things that if you're trying to migrate in the future can all will always be painful a big one is permissions um every single cloud provider has a different um permission system um and it you know it's it's always going to work differently and you always have to use it. So especially when you're building serverless, um, you have to think about, you know, giving um, your Lambda functions or your Google Cloud functions, et cetera, permission to talk to other services um, and, other pe and other things that live in your cloud. And um, there's usually like um, some sort of language that defines those permissions and it's always going to look different. So you're, if you migrate, you're going to have to rewrite those permissions. And that's just one example. So there's definitely a lot of things that make migration painful. Um, and one thing that actually people don't talk about is, is developer buy-in. Um, so when you're, as, you're, as your company grows, um, most developers are not going to be experts in multiple different cloud providers. Um, so if you have like a large team and you tell them one day, um, you know, we're all going <laughs> to, we're going to be like migrating to this other cloud provider in the future, like here in the near future, a lot of them will be like, well, I don't want to go, you know, learn that and stop using, you know, all these skills I've built up in this one that I already know. And they mm -hmm. may just go look elsewhere. So and then, um, so would you think early on about all the different requirements that you might have and think about your backend architecture now and what struck, like what um, setup might hinder you in the future and switch to it early or just- Yeah, I mean- I'm Trying to think about um, who mm -hmm. we go with in the future starting off with just- 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, really, I think that the the main thing is is that, like, you know, if if you choose like one of them, if you choose like one of the big three cloud providers, you're in good shape. Uh, um, you're probably not going to run into a use case that can't handle, anyways. Um, and then, you know, you can actually mix and match. You can use services for certain functionality from one talking to the other. Um, and so, if you're using something like Cloudflare and Cloudflare Workers, um, you know, there's definitely room to do that still. Um, I think you really just need to make a decision early on about how much you think vendor lock-in might hurt you and hurt your business, and then decide how, how much you want to prioritize it, essentially. Okay. You know, and that really depends on your own needs. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I won't take up too much time, but this is very... Uh, I feel like it's a DevOps person and then we talk to a lot of developers and they don't actually understand a lot of this, mm -hmm. the backend architecture, uh, how it should be set up. So mm -hmm. uh, we're, how much time would you spend using the backend and making sure that things are um, clean, like all the, the actions are not wasting any extra usage in the backend? Is, is maintenance a thing that you do ongoing or is it like if it's set up properly up, up front it scales up on its own and there's no human like how much human intervention ongoing would you need in a business that's you know growing and scaling um well a lot less when you're using serverless but there's always going to be okay. some level of monitoring and intervention um just because you know just because there, there's always room for mistakes, essentially. There's always room for some scenario that the, the developer didn't anticipate and that causes an error that, you know, sometimes can cascade into a larger error. And that's regardless of what cloud services you're using um, or how you architect it. But um, if you architect for success upfront, you're gonna have a lot less of that. And, you know, so you're gonna have a lot less <laughs> issues every day and, <laughs> you know, less people who actually need to keep an eye on it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you definitely do want to, from the very beginning, think about your monitoring. Look at the tools that are available for that and set up, for example, the main thing you should be thinking about is alarms. So basically something will send you a notification if you get errors in your back end um, or in your front end for that matter. Um, in AWS, the tool for that is CloudWatch. Um, you know, and you'll definitely probably want some sort of log monitoring tool where you can create like, you know, graphs and charts off your logs and whatnot. Um, you know, and it's sort of something you'll figure out as you go. Um, but it's definitely always going to be, be a consideration regardless of what tools you're using. But it's going to be a lot easier with serverless because you don't have to, you know, you don't have to think about like, you know, for example, like the network configuration and now all, uh, was, you know, got messed up. And now it's not even an issue with your code or with your, ser or, or with like your application. It's just that the, you know, you, the backend literally can't even reach your database. Um, got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, uh, well, we have four, four more minutes. So if anybody else has anything they wanted to ask about. What are some instances where this platform is really, really contraindicated? Mm -hmm. So where are some instances where you really advise against yeah, so um, I think again, uh, I mentioned I mentioned very um, very stateful memory heavy application. Uh, sorry, not memory heavy. Uh, very stateful um, real time applications. So I did use the example of like a game server. Like you're playing, like say you're playing like a you know like a real time multiplayer game, like you know like Call of Duty, Overwatch, and there's a server. It's sort of 
facilitating that, you could never ever build that on AWS Lambda or any sort of serverless. Um, I mean, you know, um, it's not to say <laughs> games in general, but just the real time sort of um, the fact that like you have this information is being tracked. Um, and it has to be like, you know, like, single milliseconds updates and you know it's like it's it's like data that's stored in memory the isolation is going to get in your way um for sure there um other than that like it is actually extremely flexible honestly there's most most applications that most businesses would use can be built with serverless um you know i guess the other contraindicated use case would be probably um if you want to use some sort of existing tech stack uh like say you're migrating a website that's um built on like wordpress you're much better off just hosting that in a server or multiple servers um than trying to <laughs> move to try and run a wordpress website in in serverless because again you kind of just have to architect things differently so if it's like a, it's a legacy application um you know, it's easy to migrate that to the cloud, easier, much easier to migrate to that cloud, that to the cloud um, using traditional servers than it would be to try and figure out how to run it on serverless. All right, I may have time for one more question. All right, looks like we're uh, coming up on time here. Um, thank you, Dax, for the presentation today. It was very informative. And um, thanks again to our sponsors. The sponsor of the Tech Tech was CloudRise. Um, again, there's a network happy, networking happy hour event uh, later today over at Altspace. I believe it's at 2.30. Uh, it'll be, if you're in GJ, it'd be a good time to meet some of the other attendees of What's Up Startup Week in person. So hope to see you there. Uh, thanks again, Dax. Thanks, Dax. Yeah, thank you.